Uh, and my background is in bioengineering. Um, uh, I started, my, my first job out of college was working in South Africa. So since then I've had the, I grew up in India and I worked in South Africa and since then I've had sort of the global bug. Um, I uh, was a Stanford India Biodesign Fellow. Um, so I have also worked in India in medtech innovation stuff. Um, and then most recently, uh, right now actually, I work for a startup company that I, I was telling some of you guys uh, is developing an oncology diagnostic product for col colorectal cancer. The technology is uh, licensed out of an uh, academic institution in Taiwan. So Taiwan and then China are our first markets and then other Asian markets and eventually once we have enough data to satisfy the FDA slash CMS slash everybody else who needs data, we will uh, come to the US. But we're primarily sort of an Asian market company. Um, and uh, over the la right before I started at this startup, um, I've, I was working for Stanford Biodesign actually and their global biodesign team and spent a lot of time sort of putting together some of the stuff that I will talk about today and really looking at what does medical technology innovation look, li look like in different parts of the world, primarily with the viewpoint that if you were uh, an American company or funded by American investors and you were thinking about the different pros and cons about diff of other markets and sort of how would you implement your strategy, where would you go and where would you look. So um, I have some resources at the end as well that in case anybody's interested or there's a particular market you're interested in talking more about, you know, let me know. And keep the questions coming as we go. Um, so Personal question, did you guys meet in biodesign? Yes, we did. <laughs> Good question. All right, everyone is thinking it. Everyone is thinking <laughs> it. <laughs> okay. Some of us know it. <laughs> um, so I was a TA in a class. Oh, shush. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, <laughs> map the world, basic stuff. Yeah. Pay attention. No, just kidding. Um, so, you know, usual. Pay attention to what it looks like. You guys know what it looks like. Now, this is one way by population. Just so we all get in the picture of, you know, the West is the West. There's a lot of people who live in the Western world and in Japan, but a lot of people live in Asia as well. Um, and, you know, we don't talk that much about medical devices in other parts of the world. Do you have one based on revenue? Um, this is one based on public health expenditure, which is a good proxy for medical device infrastructure, healthcare infrastructure stuff. Look at the bloat in North, North America and in Western Europe particularly, um, and then in Japan as well. And compared to the, the population size, India and Africa particularly is like almost nothing, right? Um, and just for curiosity's sake, there's the private healthcare expenditure in which the US is even more bloated. Um, and now you can see that India and China are actually starting to show up because a lot of expenditure in these countries is out of pocket spending, so private healthcare expenditure. Um, but Japan, again, they spend a lot of money on their healthcare, um, and in Africa and even Latin America, really not so much. Um, so, given this sort of simple framing, right, it's not surprising that if you look at the medtech market, it's dominated by the US, and then by Europe, which is almost three, three quarters of the market. Then Asia, a lot of that Asian pie is actually Japan, and then the rest of the world is about 10%. Just, just quick question from the previous map, is this considering like also how these countries invest, I mean the expenditure that they have in healthcare, considering their system? Right, so, so public expenditure would be something that the government spends, right, all your public health care uh, facilities, and then private expenditure would be private clinics, people okay. spending out of pocket, all that stuff. So this okay. is drawn from WHO data, and okay. that's how they usually report it, public private health care expenditure. Mm -hmm. So if you look at like 17, 18% of GDP number in the US, that's private plus public, okay. right? Um, so this pie chart has been fairly stable for you know a couple of decades. Um, but there are a few new trends now, and, and the pie for the US and Europe to a certain extent is, is shrinking. Um, and one of the first trends is where the growth, so if you look at North America there, uh, the compound growth that they're projecting is about 3%. Um, and this is a, a pharma chart, but it's again a good proxy for medical device development. And look at Asia Pacific here, um, about 16%. Um, if you look at some of the, the other emerging, so-called emerging markets like Latin America or even Middle East and Africa, like step up to 10% growth every year as opposed to like Western Europe, which is zero to 3%. So that's sort of the first trend why people are looking abroad, right? Why Medtronic is interested in having a center in Shanghai and why uh, GAJ is going abroad and all of this stuff, just because of, that's where the growth is. 
I have a question about Europe. So the, the reason for that is because Europe is viewed as a bloc, like the, Euro the European Union, and um, the, it's, it's really hard, or just because that's Europe? <laughs> So they divided up Western and Eastern Europe. I think that's because that's how they do. You know, Western Europe is sort of your Germany, France, UK, um, Italy. So those are the big markets, right? Um, where the growth is slowing for a variety of socioeconomic reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and then Central East Eastern Europe, which becomes more of like the emerging market countries, right? Like Poland and and some of those economies that are not doing so badly. You know, not that affected by like the debt crisis, for instance, and so on. Um, so and they've traditionally been kept separate, right? Like when people say. Europe, they usually mean Western Europe, in, at least in the healthcare market kind of sense, right? You, like, are not necessarily going to like Lithuania, or when you say going to Europe. How about it's Israel? Israel's a huge market, right? No, actually, Israel is not a very large market. It is. <laughs> we're we're going to get to Israel. Um, okay, so the first trend is is the growth that's shifting to the east, and then the second trend is, you know, wealth that's also shifting to the east. This is a chart from The Economist that's showing the, uh, the share of world GDP and that it's supposed to converge in the next few years uh, between the developed and emerging markets. Um, and that just tells you if there's more money in these markets, you know, people are going to start to think of healthcare um, as a bigger priority. Um, and then the third trend that is pretty interesting is the fact that chronic diseases, as opposed to infectious diseases, um, is what is increasing um, in most of the world. Most of global deaths are now being accounted for, a majority are being accounted for by uh, non-communicable diseases in all segments of the, all the different types of uh, income group countries there are, right? Um, so that's the, the blue here. So even in the lower middle, where traditionally people used to think infectious diseases, TB, HIV, AIDS, malaria, that's the bur burden of disease in those countries, that's changing. And the reason that's important is because a lot of the medical technology that exists today, it has been catering to a Western, Europe, uh, Western European, US, Japanese market where chronic disease management is really the primary focus. So now all those technologies can be applied to this whole new market of people who have the same kinds of diseases, cardiac disease, diabetes, and so on. So there are a few other trends, uh, but I would say these three are the big ones you know, globalization, or however you want to call it, flattening of the world and so on, uh, enabling technologies that are growing. You don't have to be right next to somebody to deliver them care. I think that's changing some stuff. As governments, uh, emerging market governments have more money, they're spending more money on healthcare as well. Um, and in some countries, uh, indigenous innovation, indigenous technology development um, is also a, a reason for why you're having more medical device innovation or more medical device market development um, outside of uh, sort of the traditional markets. Um, but so you guys are all medtech innovators working in the medical device innovation space. So you care about sort of where the money is and so on, but some of the, the things that we care about in this business, which is a complex business with regulation and um, uh, you know who's going to pay and, and so on, these are the factors we care most about, right? So money, yes, but also regulation, also patents. Where can you really enforce your patents? Um, and the presence of healthcare infrastructure. So unlike pharmaceuticals, where you have a doctor and you have maybe a nurse or not, and you can dispense pills, for most of medical technology, you need a building, you need some skilled providers, um, you need a certain level of infrastructure. Um, and some people say that's one of the reasons why there's so much pill pushing. Like the pharmaceutical uh, markets in India and China, for instance, are fairly well developed because it's not that dependent on healthcare infrastructure in a way the medical technology r really is. So, um, and then of course, overarching, right, the ease of doing business. We're, we're in the sort of startup, early stage innovation kind of business, and that's where I'm focusing right now. Um, and if, if it's too hard to get things done in those markets, that's not necessarily where innovation will first be. Right? It, may, it may get driven there, but uh, it may not. So you could have a lot of those other things. You know, one example is like Saudi Arabia. A lot of money, pretty good healthcare infrastructure, um, you know, regulation. Well, there's not that much regulation, which can be a good thing, right? But the ease of doing business is really just not there. So it, it, there's a lot of money, but you can't go after it really. So it's not like somebody's going to is about to start uh, startups uh, over there. So the so the next few charts that I want to show are going to start to talk more specifically about particular countries and their um, their medical device innovation. Um, scenarios 
And this, these come from this innovation scorecard that PwC puts out every few years, which I recommend uh, to look at if you guys are interested in sort of comparing different markets against, the, uh, against each other. Any questions before I jump in? So about tapping. So mm -hmm. now you know in many countries in Southeast Asia, Thailand's a lot of money here. Mm -hmm. And so for a company, that's a huge deal. Right. So how so uh, would you mind if I table that discussion and we get to okay. patents? Because yeah. I think there's uh, there's some pretty good interesting case stories around sort of you know markets where people think patents are not enforceable and, and the importance. So go ahead. Where does federal taxes come into play? Um, I mean, I think not that high on the list, right? Like, so if you just think about the fact that the U.S. taxes uh, their company companies' profits abroad here, right? But people still consider the U.S. a fairly good place to do business, right? Like, ta bur taxation burden is pretty high here. So in that sense, I think in the scheme of things, actually, if your country is able to tax you uh, well, they're probably doing a lot of other things right. And you know, so I, I would say not that. But then again, Metronic is now an Irish company, so you know, there's, which there's is, other ways to Which think is about still it. being discussed. Right. <laughs> so, so Burger King is a Canadian company. Yeah. yeah that's right. Tim Hortons, so, right. Um, and Warren Buffett is a tax evader. Anyway, um, so the first graph here um, is actually about the money, right? Where the funding is happening. Um, so it's uh, on the x axis where you have sort of the kind of the deal size and then deal activity is on the on the y axis um, and you can see Israel is like clearly an outlier here right like a lot of um, uh, a lot a lot of investments happening there the u s is obviously another um, s kind of outlier if you look at China you see a lot of smaller deals but a lot of them right and India has somewhat of the same problem uh, where the deal size is not that large but there's a uh, significant amount of activity even compared to what it was like about 10 years ago. Um, and then some of the, the European countries not doing that well in terms of VC investment. Um, How could this be so low in terms of amount of investment? Or this is looking specifically at medical technology. Number of deals. Um, is that number of deals or? This is, so <coughs> it's, that's the size. Uh -huh. So it's fairly large in size, right? But it's talking about investment as percentage of GDP. So the GDP is so high that they just dwarfed it. Uh, this, you see, okay. right there. Um, so, so okay. So that's where, if you were looking for money, you know, that gives you a sense of where you'd be going. Um, the next thing that we worry about is is regulation, right? Um, so here, Japan is a major outlier, which uh, uh, you know, a lot of people who um, may have heard about that. Their PMTA is one of the most notorious difficult and long processes. Israel is on the other end, an outlier. Um, and then, you know, sort of the other countries, as you can see, they fall uh, fall over there. They have the most VC investment, too. Yeah, everybody should move to Israel. Um, that's really strange. So Jeffrey and me, we went to this uh, conference at uh, Sydney, and they said, like, the UN, the EU mm -hmm. is now aggregating together and their FDA, which is the key mm -hmm. market, is going to be the same for the whole country, for all the countries. And here you, s you spread it by France, Germany, UK. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it depends on like kind of where your notified body is, right? Like different notified bodies can give you different levels of, of how much clinical, you know, how much data you need and so on, because it's not a centralized process like the FDA. So depending on which notified body you get, so people actually have like papers on which notified bodies to go for cardiac implants and which ones to go for, you know, whatever else kind of thing, nice. because different notified bodies build expertise in different things and they'll ask you questions commensurate with their expertise. Um, so any other questions on this one? Can I ask a question about the dollars slide? And I think it was the one before this. Yeah, sure. <coughs> are, are those, uh, <coughs> is that money from China or into China, into companies in China or both? Uh, this would be, so you can't invest, in, in China you have to have a subsidiary to put money to play in China. So it would be, you know, even if it was like a venture firm here, they would have a subsidiary that was then investing in China. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't just put money from Silicon Valley here, right, mm -hmm. into China directly. So does that answer the question? Uh, well, I mean, some, 
some firms might invest in something that's say, you know, let's say in the States we invest in something that's Canadian. Mm -hmm. So where, where would that fall here? Would it be United States dollars or yeah, would it be Yeah, I, th I think Canadian? so. I think it would okay. probably get bucketed there. Like the U.S. probably investing in Israel is still probably bucketed under the U.S. Okay, so it's yeah. a source of dollars. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, sure. A source um, of money. And then we'll get to the patent <coughs> question, which is um, the, Chine the China the uh, Chinese patent office just overtook like everybody uh, in the number of patent applications received and granted. Um, it's an interesting chart, it's an interesting number, but uh, you know a lot of people question the validity of, 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 the num of the number of the patents, the quality of the patents, the value of really so many people patenting away to glory. Um, but one thing that this is an indicator for is that China is taking patenting very seriously, right? They're setting up all kinds of policies to say, uh, if you submit a patent, here's you know what more money. If you, if your university can submit these many patents a year, you get more funding. So they get that patents are a, uh, a are an indicator globally for research output, for technology innovation, and so on. And they are just gunning it. Um, so in that sense, the, even though enforcement patent enforcement in China may may not be that great, right? And in fact, it can be pretty sometimes be counter productive for US companies because they will, uh, often in local Chinese courts, Chinese companies win by virtue of being Chinese companies. Um, and this has happened to big players as well, like Apple and Samsung and so on in local courts. Um, but uh, you know, you still no longer can get away without patenting in some of these, these countries, right? Um, and, and Chinese companies, when they go to other parts of say Asia, East Asia, they're still, they're still thinking about patenting because now they've all gotten into this mode of valuing patents in a way that they didn't do maybe 10 years ago. But like if, if you look at India, for example, yeah, there's only like five, is it five volunteers that were granted? Five thousand. Five thousand yeah. that were granted and like anyhow it's very low. So yeah. let's say there's a company that works and operates in India and mm -hmm. there's a big chance that the technology would be stolen. <laughs> There's a big chance the technology would be stolen anyway, um, yeah, well, right? right? So in, in some sense, the patent is, like for instance in India, uh, the patent is more for raising money. Um, like I have patented because pe VCs think still are, are learning from Silicon Valley and use it as one of their benchmarks to figure out how valuable my technology is. How I'm going to defend my technology may have nothing to do with patents, may have everything to do with trade secrets, may have everything to do with um, you know, wh where am I hiring talent from, where am I sourcing materials from, and so on. And I think that's true in China to a certain extent as well. Um, but still, a lot of the patenting that may be happening, especially for sort of um, medical device innovation companies, which tend to be, have like pre sort of global people in them, you know, people who've studied abroad and so on, um, they may be doing it because, you know, it, 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 it makes sense to get funding. Mm -hmm. um, so. Any but other feel questions? Feel free to use some stuff here. I'm gonna grab one of these, uh -huh. thanks. Any other questions on this one? Also, Karen, um, India didn't apply for that many as well. They only applied for, what, 50? Yeah, I know. I'm years. saying they don't apply and they don't grant a lot. That means yeah. that they don't have a lot of like value or respect or culture of patents, you know? Yeah. Also, just research <coughs> output, right? Like yeah, India just doesn't have that much research <coughs> output. Um, <coughs> and to say that China has that much more than the US, it, I mean, it's like almost it couldn't be true. Are people trying to... Right. Um, Anyway, okay, so, mm -hmm. and then the, uh, the the last sort of bucket there um, was um, healthcare infrastructure, and this is an interesting um, chart that, you know, in which it's not really like one corner is better than the other, it's physicians versus hospital beds. It's just giving you a sense of how healthcare is being utilized in different countries. So Japan, for instance, has the la highest number of hospital beds, um, and India and China, unsurprisingly, have much fewer physicians per you know, 10,000 of the population. And sort of as you can see some of the other countries as they fall um, in different di uh, sort of different parts of that, that chart. So again, when you're looking at sort of those emerging markets, you have to think about the kinds of technologies that will be applied very differently. Right? You just don't have, um, the, the needs on the ground are quite different because it's not a very hospital-based kind of healthcare delivery mechanism just not that many hospital beds. Um, a lot of it has to do with clinics, it has to do with smaller facilities, um, and then the technologies that are deployed in those spaces are also different. Um, so 
all this to say, this entire report, all this to say that the US remains a very attractive place to start a company, um, you know, for, for a variety of reasons, um, including very developed healthcare infrastructure, great ability to pay, um, and lots of good VC funding, at least until uh, you guys, probably you guys. <laughs> Um, so we don't do any deals either, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't really. <laughs> so, wait, are you guys like number no, one on some don't. report now? We are the best. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no question about that. Um, if you don't invest, you can't make mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, it is an easy place to start a company, but, you know, there's a slowing growth trend and the more money in other markets trends and all those other trends. So, if you were looking to start a company somewhere else in the world, you know, where, where in the world should you go? Um, so, first one is Israel, right? And Karen obviously can tell us more uh, about it uh, than, than me. That's quite, quite surprising to me, actually, with all these numbers. So, I know the massive uh, industry is booming, but still the money is very tight. Hmm. Very tight. Yeah. There are lots of government funds. There are some VCs, not a lot of angel investors at all. Uh, that's actually encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I found this uh, the, uh, this number, which I think is just like insane, right? More companies on the NASDAQ than EU, India, China combined. I mean, they're obviously doing something, right? Well, um, NASDAQ, I mean, that's a US based. Uh, okay, but still, like China considers being on the NASDAQ a fairly prestigious thing as well, right? And if they can push on patents, or well, maybe they'll overtake Israel next year. No, the, the problem with Israel is that a lot of companies get funding from the government, and then for the next stage, they move to the U.S. Hmm. So it makes sense for them to go to NASDAQ. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, so, you know, Israel ha obviously has things in its favor in terms of startup companies, but it's a very small domestic market, so you would be looking elsewhere um, to do any kind of scaling, right? Um, Ireland is another country that's becoming very important in terms of medical device innovation, earlier stage innovation. So they have been traditionally fairly strong in medical device manufacturing. Um, eight out of the ten med tech companies, the top med tech companies have manufacturing in, in Ireland. And as you know, you know, Medtronic is an Irish company now, or will be anytime, you know, soon, shortly. Um, but the Irish government has pushed, especially since the, the, uh, the recession, right, they really focused on innovation as a, a vehicle for growth in the country, um, and they actually have, they're the first affiliate of the Stanford Biozyme Program, um, global affiliate, um, so they've started this partnership, they're doing a uh, same kind of fellowship program, uh, primarily funded by government dollars, because the government is really pushing into this. Uh, the, uh, not the foundry, uh, no, is it the foundry? I think the foundry has now a new incubator in um, Ireland called Fire, Fire One, and, and um, What's your friend's name? Um, um, there was an Irish guy that came to one of the. There was, yeah. yeah. He was one of the fellows from the Bioinnovate. Yeah, so the Bioinnovate program. No, but I was thinking about, oh, Lightstone. So Foundry and Lightstone have jointly invested in an incubator in Ireland, and they've also funded a company yeah. there. Um, and that's primarily for you know making use of funds that the, the Irish government is providing for people who will. Um, there, there are some stipulations, like you have to have a base in Ireland, you have to have at least one C-level executive based out of Ireland, and, and so on. So, but because they have such a deep uh, s set of experience from the manufacturing, there are a lot of med tech, there's a lot of med tech talent in the country. So that's another, you know, attractive place for getting early stage funding. Um, and then some other um, countries, like Singapore, for instance, has also done a lot to give um, you know, money and facilities and other kinds of support to early stage companies that are willing to locate there. Uh, so primarily for funding. Um, you know, Australia is another place that people don't go for funding so much, but for IPOs, uh, because until, maybe not so much right now, but about uh, five, three, four, five years ago, um, the IPO market was pretty um, conducive for medtech companies to go public there. So a lot of people would collect uh, evidence in, in um, Australia, do clinical trials there and then uh, IPO. Um, and then, you know, there are all kinds of cla crazy places like Cayman Islands. If you want to move money around, if you want to be truly global, if you want to be able to accept money from different kinds of places, sort of getting back to one of your questions, right? Um, there I know several companies that are set up in these kinds of tax havens, 
you can take money from Silicon Valley investors, you can take money from Chinese investors, you know, sort of wherever, and you base yourself wherever, whichever way you go. So this is sort of the global company, meta company model. Um, but so these are primarily, all these ones that I've listed are, are small markets, right? And like everybody wants this, right? This is what everybody tells you in their pitch, right? They're gonna have that hockey stick growth and it's gonna just expand. So if you want that, where should you go, right? And it's probably over here. Um, so this, and maybe I'll give you guys a, a bit of time to just look through these, um, but 26%, this is medical devices specifically in China, right, a year in your growth, 14% in India, Australia is like the weak link here, 2.6%, 10 um, 10% uh, there, Japan is about 5%, which is actually kind of surprising to me because they are going through so much contraction as well. But Southeast Asia, which is probably the least developed medtech market in this entire area, is still almost 10% growth. So just the potential is enormous, right? Markets are not easy to access, but if you do have a winning formula and you know what you're doing, the, the, the upside potential is just um, is, is, uh, incredible. So let's um, go through some of these countries, and I wanna tell you guys a few, um, few stories and some interesting facts around medical devices, um, and let's start with China. So none of these numbers are surprising to anybody. I think you guys all know. Um, uh, one fact here, the middle class and affluent population, um, which I guess is a BCG analysis, 52%, um, right? This is a very different market in that sense from the other Asian giant, India, right? There are a lot of people who are willing to pay out of pocket for healthcare. Um, in, in this country, right? More than half of the, or half of the population. Um, and that's really leading to sort of those 17, 20, 25, 30%. I think that's an overstated percentage though. If you look, it's over 10,000 annual income. But this, but it goes very far in these countries, right? Like the... Yeah, but I think, you know, we, uh, I think half the market is not totally available for, because it's all patient, pay, uh, individual pay. So I think really the affluent ones who are the ones who can pay for the Right, but that. that's still like 600 million, million people, right? It's like more than twice the US, entire US population. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, but you're right that there is definitely like a tiering in this market, right? So you have the, the top tier where you have the, the big cities, um, they primarily uh, go for medical devices that are by the in, imported, um, so the, the big names uh, that we know. And then there's a second tier, which is very large, um, and it's in the smaller towns or the smaller hospitals in the bigger cities. Um, and they have a very uh, strong, robust, particularly in uh, some sectors, like um, Kamsi uh, uh, in um, orthopedics, pretty robust uh, uh, industry in, in, in medical devices. So th these, the second tier markets will be uh, serviced by some mix of local as well as imported. And then there's a third tier, which is really low end domestic, which is not really a place that, you know, US based or US uh, connected companies are really looking at. But between these two tiers, I mean, I would say even the first tier has not fully been exploited r right now, but the second tier for sure. There's a lot of opportunity there. Um, and one of the things that I, uh, one of the things that I wanna talk about next is some of the, the example sectors that have been really successful in medical device, in, um, um, in, in China. So one of them is, is STEM. Um, and this is actually, this also starts out as a patent story. GNJ, when they brought in the DES um, in like 99 and 2000, did not fully patent it in China. And that's one of the, that was one of the stimulus, um, stimuli for um, the local companies to come in. So as you can see in early, um, G, so GNJ starts, comes in, um, and this was really with their, um, they had the DES on the market, the drug eluting set on the market, but that's not what they started in the uh, in China with. And you had about you still had about a third of the market is local. And then now this is kind of like the stable uh, kind of thing, and locals really uh, dominate the market. Um, and some of these companies, like Microforward and Lipu and so on, have now gotten so much experience doing very high end medical device manufacturing. They are branching out. Um, into other sectors of the of the market, but Sense is really one of the big uh, success stories um, in in Chinese medtech. Um, you know, some of the companies here, uh, Microfort Biosensors, um, and so on, and then Orthopedics uh, is another success story, um, and Crossin, um, uh, and Kangui as well. Kangui was acquired by um, 
Medtronic. Um, and then some of these other companies that are coming up, like MindRavens, which is the largest uh, medical device company in China today. Uh, and they are really big in ultrasound imaging, ultrasound color imaging. They've come up with all these kinds of interesting technologies that you don't even really hear about in the US. Um, and they've done a lot of sort of field study about what people and patients and physicians care about in China. Um, and they're able to very well service those markets. Now, like sort of a small caveat, side note, a lot of these companies, once they become successful, they, these all, all of these started as startups, right? Um, but once they become successful, for instance, MindRay, MindRay now is essentially a, uh, like, significantly funded by the Chinese government. Um, so because it became a successful company and because medical technology is such a high tech field, that's something that the government wants to sort of quote, uh, showcase, um, that they have a lot of money that the Chinese government has put in through a variety of different vehicles. Um, and even though they're supposed to be the largest company in China, I'm not sure if those numbers are real. Because um, I think it was uh, PwC who was their accountant and sort of pulled the, pulled the plug and said, you know, we can't really back the numbers that we're seeing and we cannot, we are no longer going to be responsible for, for uh, reporting numbers out of this company just because there's so much, so lack of transparency in, in revenue and, and all kinds of numbers that come out of this. But still, you know, it's probably a fairly big company and it's able to serve this market pretty well. Um, so worth looking at. Um, and and uh, just to know, before you, you continue, sure. you, you, can you say there's a clear difference between big companies going into these markets and startups that are going to these markets? I believe there is. Because yeah. startups, they just trying to develop and like yeah. sell back to the West. Right. That's right? Or not necessarily. I would actually say the big difference is that there are very few startups going to China. Mm -hmm. Right? Particularly in the case of China, I think there are very few ones that do that because it's just such a hard market to function in. Um, uh, there's so much, uh, so l lack of so much lack of transparency. One good example, though, is actually biosensors. The technology was developed here in San Diego, um, and the guy um, Yochi Lu, he actually speaks for the BioDesign class pretty regularly. He uh, knew the Chinese market. He, he he had grown up in China, so he knew that you always wanted to take it there, and he had understood this sort of PES 10 patenting vacuum kind of thing, um, and he set up a joint venture with another company. Um, and went there. So he brought all the technology development, the basic technology development, the polymer coating and all that was done here. But he just managed to, you know, but he was very much focused on the Chinese market. He was always going to do that. And he came with a lot of money um, as well. He was able to do it, raise enough money that I wouldn't even, in a way, call it a startup. Um, you know, not sort of the levels that we talk about, like not a few, few million. Like he was looking at like a $50 million investment from his investors and a $100 million investment from his Chinese partner and so on. So it was like a fairly large sized company. Um, but I think that there are not really that many startups that are going to China from here. But there are Chinese startups that are you know, able to uh, go and a lot of them do have sort of, uh, you know, they call them the, the turtles, like people who return back from here to live in China. Um, and, and many of them are able to do pretty well. Like a lot of these companies have like Microport and stuff have ex uh, people from US universities and so on working there. So basically the, the Western companies that you'll see doing business in China, or not doing business, but opening a branch in China and trying to patent there would be the big ones. Primarily, okay. yeah. Unless there was a small company and they were looking only at the Chinese market and they had a joint venture or came up with a wholly owned subsidiary or something like that. And you know, they're going to focus on the Chinese market, which in a way then makes them a Chinese company. Um, so anyway, this just wanted to put that fact up there that uh, the Kang Lee and the Trotson uh, acquisition that happened, um, which is kind of a sign of the, the uh, maturing of this market, right? Like in uh, 20, um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, these companies came on, they captured a large share of the, the Chinese market, primarily the middle tier that the big companies have a lot of difficulty getting to. Um, and then and then they were successfully acquired so that the bigger companies can branch into that second tier. And just one quick thing that I forgot to mention about this figure, this, the Indian market looks a lot like this as well. The top tier, the second tier, and the third tier. I mean, I think it's like just a smaller triangle, but uh, it, it breaks out a lot in the same way and the same kind of considerations around the bigger companies um, uh, on the top tier kind of apply. So with that, let's actually move to India. Um, so again, basic numbers here, uh, metech market growth and so on. And now skim over this. 
Um, but in India, there's uh, you know kind of like we saw that triangle in, in China. There's actually I would say even more segmentation in the in the different segments. This is a McKinsey study in which they have all these pretty names: global strivers, seekers, aspirers. Um, all this stuff, but all this to say that the, the market is very diverse and different ways, that the way you capture different segments of the market will be fairly different. Um, even in private healthcare, you have to think about whether you're in a large city or a small city or a you know, tier three city because healthcare infrastructure will vary a lot, training of hospitals, training of doctors will vary a lot, uh, electricity, you know, whether it's available or not will vary a lot, which makes a huge difference when you're selling uh, medical devices. But the success story in India, I would argue, is really around healthcare delivery, um, which is a subset of medical technology, or medical technology is able to uh, help that. Uh, but one of the success, first success stories that came out was the Arvind Eye Care System, which Harvard Business Review covered and all of this stuff. Uh, this guy, Arvind, Dr. Arvind, he was really inspired by the standardization in the McDonald's delivery chain system. And he was like, well, if you can give, get a burger anywhere in the world that tastes, or french fries that tastes like the same, then why can't I do cataract operations anywhere, you know? It's kind of a stretch. But still, basically what he set up, and what you can see in that photograph, is that one doctor will do a whole line of cataract surgeries. There'll be a bunch of lower paid workers who set up the patient and, and you know, make sure that everything is ready. The doctor will do the surgery and then move to the next one, then move to the next one, move to the next one, and he'll do like, 50 sur cataract surgeries in a day. So they managed to increase throughput by just a huge amount. And one of the ways that they bring in patients, because another thing is healthcare access, right? People need to know that they can come in and so on. They run these camps, um, they'll take buses that are stocked with all, all kinds of medical supplies, and then they'll run these camps and do screenings for cataracts, and people who have cataract uh, and need, need treatment, they'll bus them into the hospital. Um, and they also have a very interesting cross-subsidy system in which uh, you know, different people in the same hospital pay different prices. Um, and that's how they're able to subsidize basically free care for very poor people, but at cost pay, pay, uh, uh, payment for um, you know, sort of people who are able to pay. Um, and this was in the 90s, um, and you know, they've been very successful. There are a few other ones. Uh, but this, these, this model of healthcare, you know, uh, healthcare delivery innovation has been now taken forward by several other companies. Um, so this is a Harvard Business Review study from last year that is comparing costs for oncology, kidney dial uh, dialysis, other kinds of uh, treatments uh, uh, amongst various different kinds of hospitals. So there are many other hospitals that have come up that are really competing on price, right? Uh, so there's medical to business impl implications of this but also just to serve the, the native population, because there's a lot of people who are underserved. And they're using so many of the principles that Arvind Aikai does. You know, standardization, how many uh, tasks can you move to lower skilled workers that don't cost as much, um, you know, how, what else can you do to make it? It's a very simple kind of service experience. There's no uh, like fancy curtains or AC or you know, whatever, AC is optional. Um, uh, one of the other things that many of these hospitals have done is implemented um, um, training for family members. So post-operative training, the family members sit for like two or three hour sessions of how you would do post-operative training. So they're able to get patients off of beds much quicker and not have people coming back to the hospital for you know, post-operative work. So they've really managed to see you know, what are the most essential tasks that doctors have to do, and then everything else can be outsourced to people who are plentiful and can be trained pretty easily. So that's, that's the Indian um, sort of medtech innovation story. Um, and then the last one I wanted to talk about is Japan uh, in terms of Asian markets. Um, you know, th some of the facts around Japan, I guess a lot of you must know about, you know, it's like, it's an OECD country, it's very rich. Um, it has a great healthcare system. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, they're very mature medtech market. Is it uh, public? Yes. It's high token, it's, it's universal coverage, um, and yeah, they have a huge amount of utilization of healthcare as well. That's one of their problems is the high cost of burden of their healthcare system. But also, their population is aging. Right. Yeah, well, really mm -hmm. old. Um, so, there's more utilization just because of that. Yeah, but even so, they, they have the largest uh, number of MRI ultrasound machines per capita. Like, they're just a very high tech society, um, and they've embraced medical technology, you know. 25, 30 years now. 
Um, so, and you know, if you talk about Japan to most people who are looking at global markets, they'll be like, yes, it's a great market, it's really hard to get into because the PMDA is really difficult, which is their regulatory body. Um, and without the PMDA, you can't go through to the next step, which is uh, reimbursement, right? So I want to give you guys a, a quick story about this company, which is a foundry company, Miramar Labs. They have a, uh, a disposable plus capital equipment kind of model based here, funded here. They were looking at what other markets could they go to that would be a good pilot market for them to get some early data and early revenue as well. Um, and when I was at Biodesign, I wrote a case study on them. They looked around at, at various different markets, and one thing, uh, let me tell you about their technology so you know why it makes more sense. It's an out-of-pocket pay um, um, system for people who perspire a lot. So it's like a, who what? Pers you know, sweat, sweat a lot. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So it's like a zapper, like an underarm zapper, basically. So in some senses, it's like a cosmetic, um, aesthetic uh, treatment. There is a, um, uh, like a medical term for it as well, so you can be medically diagnosed with a condition, but a lot of people do to choose to do that. You know, it's an out-of-pocket uh, thing. They choose to do it for cosmetic reasons. So they were looking a lot at Japan, Korea, Brazil, some of these markets that are known for high out-of-pocket uh, payments for uh, aesthetic dermatology, these types of treatments. Um, and they ended up going to Japan because what they understood was, uh, what they found out was that um, there's this kind of a loophole, I guess, um, in the Japanese regulation system where for a cert uh, there's a cap of how many devices you can sell, but you have to sell it them, sorry, let me look at my notes, it's called physician direct sales. So they, the physician directly sources it from the manufacturer and sells the product out of their own clinic. They were able to sell, um, I think like $4 million worth of product in the first three years. Um, and get a really good understanding of pricing, really good understanding of how they had to position the product, um, and so on. And you know, he, the, the guy I in interviewed for this, he has just only good things to say about the Japanese regulation system, which is quite counterintuitive to what he would generally hear. So kind of the takeaway from that is, you know, your device may have some things for which make it a really good match for particular kinds of markets. So it's worth looking into, because the US will always be a big hurdle in terms of reimbursement and FDA, and if you can get some of that early revenue early on, you know, why not? And that's kind of like what my current company is doing. We're going to Taiwan because regulations there are much lower, um, and even though the country has universal coverage, so to speak, 40% of healthcare expenditure is out of pocket. So people are very willing to pay out of pocket. It's a relatively rich country um, for things that they think are important. So, you know, making it out, going to an out of pocket market just takes away a whole barrier of you know figuring out going through the reimbursement process. So I had coffee with uh, the former director of marketing for Miramar Labs. Mm -hmm. He was just let go. About a third of the company was just let go. Mm. <laughs> so okay. <laughs> not interesting. <laughs> yeah, and four million dollars in three years is not a lot of sales. But for a company that would have waited till like the sixth year of founding to have any dollars at all, right? Um, okay, so. Last region of the world, even though I only focused on Asia, um, is I can't stop without talking about uh, Africa because that's where I started my career. Um, also, it's a really sad story, but not entirely. Um, you know, 11% of the population, 24% of the disease burden, less than 1% of healthcare expenditure, um, right? And the healthcare infrastructure in Africa is dominated by aid, as in foreign aid, and also AIDS. Right, as an HIV AIDS. So like everything that exists, everything that has been set up, at least in the last 15 or 20 years has happened because of the HIV AIDS crisis. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, in that sense, it's a grim story, but because so many people have been interested in, in the AIDS crisis and funding it and, and so on, that there's some really interesting medical device innovation stories that are starting to come out of Africa. And this is another case study that I did uh, for a company called Daktari Diagnostics. They're based out of Boston. Um, the guy who, who started it, ran it, or used to work for the Clinton Foundation, and he worked on um, you know, dr uh, uh, ARV access for, um, for South Africa specifically, and they were able to negotiate lower prices from uh, pharma companies and so on. And he got really interested in management of a AIDS as a chronic disease, which is what it's become now, right? Because your drugs are so good that you just, the people are staying alive, now you need to manage, manage their care, almost like you would manage diabetes. So, one of the things that he figured out was, uh, okay, so you can dose people, you can give people drugs, 
but dosing is pretty difficult. And the way that they figure out dosing is with CD4 cell counts. And there are no CD4 cell counters that are, you know, that meet the requirements of those the, that market, right? It's portable and, and pretty rugged. It can give you a readout pretty quickly. You don't have to get the patient to give blood today and come back tomorrow. You'll never see that patient again, um, and so on. So they, uh, so this company has raised money sort of all over the world um, with Foundation Health and as well as VCs. Uh, their manufacturing is actually set up in Scotland, and they are now selling in South Africa these CD4 cell counters that they are um, in, in contract to talk with various other governments. And one of the interesting things about this market is that it's a very consolidated healthcare market. So if you have a product and if you can convince somebody in the South African government or the Kenyan government that this makes sense, you will get golf orders. So like after, once they had that first pilot that came through, their biggest hurry was to set up manufacturing so they could be you know, going at scale, which is kind of a problem you don't really have in many other markets, right? Scaling requires a lot of time. Here, if you can convince somebody that this is worth investing in, you know, boom, you're ready to go. So, what is it about Kenya and South Africa that make them, uh, that make them so attractive? So, most of these countries are like that, but South Africa and Kenya are sort of the richest with the most developed healthcare uh, infrastructure. Yeah. But um, you know, there's not a lot of private uh, healthcare. Uh, there's not a lot of public healthcare either, as we saw from those graphs before. But whatever does exist is public uh, infrastructure. So then, you know, from a very centralized kind of authority, every be every bed sheet and every you know stethoscope and everything is like um, sort of um, purchased by tender and so on. So, but once you get that one tender for South Africa, um, if your company is able to win that, you know, you can be supplying to twenty thousand healthcare clinics um, in the next year, and that can be a big problem for a startup company, right? Like, how do you scale up that quickly? Which is a good problem to have. So, I think also we can't really look at Africa as a block. Like North yeah. Africa is like the Muslim countries, they have different culture. I, I bet age is not that big no, of a problem. No, in North definitely Africa. Africa, yeah. It's Sub Saharan Africa, then you have West Africa, which are poor in unbelievable yeah. way. Mm -hmm. Then Eastern Africa, they have the safari and stuff, so they yeah. have much more money. And then, uh, so if you look, it's just because I traveled a lot in Africa, so you have like Kenya and Tanzania. And then I think South Africa and Botswana, Namibia and Botswana, Namibia, Botswana yeah, very like good. Namibia is super rich. Yeah, and it's Botswana is one of the best healthcare. Yeah, I represented them in high school when I was doing uh, Model UN. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I used to know a lot about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, uh, they said they have like silver diamonds. I don't know how true it is. Uh -huh. But like Namibia is supposed to be like super, super rich. So yeah. there's a, you can't look at it as a block. Yeah. Oh, I'm not. Yeah, no, I'm just saying, yeah, yeah. you said why Kenya and South Africa, that's because it's the eastern and north of yeah. South Africa. Yeah, and, and obviously South Africa is by far and away the richest uh, country, right? Um, so, so, you know, no global medtech talk would be done if we didn't talk about clinical trials, because that's what people really think about when they think about startup companies going abroad. Um, and I don't, I'm not going to talk too much about this, because I have... I guess technically we are running, an, my company is running an old US clinical trial, but we don't think about it that way because we're running it with a Taiwanese um, a collaborator who knows everything about that market. Um, but sort of the places that people think about traditionally, right, in Western Europe, um, you go there, you get your CE marking, you're, you're getting clinical data. Australia is another one. Um, now Eastern Europe and Latin America, so Eastern Europe, Poland and spe specifically in Latin America, Chile is, an, is a place where a lot of people are <coughs> finding collaborators and, and doing studies and so on. But if you look at the numbers, it's actually China and India that have the largest clinical trial activity, specifically for medical devices. I'm not talking about pharma. Um, and you know, so for a startup company, it makes sense to go there because then if you have data there, then you can even start selling there, as opposed to going to a small domestic market where you just get data and you don't get to build your product. So, um, so anyway, if you're thinking about going abroad, you know, the world is your oyster. Um, if you have specific regions of the world that you're interested in knowing more about, I um, have this sort of reference list here, some of the things that I find more, uh, I have found more useful. Um, there's a bunch of material on, sorry for the biodesign plug, like shameless biodesign plug, but uh, the second edition of the biodesign textbook is going to have a bunch of case studies and a lot of material around doing specifically medical device innovation abroad in a variety of markets. Um, there are already online chapters available at the on the bio, uh, e biodesign site, um, and then you know there's my email. 
you're physically interested in particular markets, you know, if, if I don't know it, I can point you to other resources. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for your time. <laughs>